On July 11, 2004, Mike Melton, an employee of Riley Industrial Services, a gas tank cleaning services company, was cleaning a drain sump tank, the toxic waste catch basin at Encana's natural gas plant near Moab, Utah, when an explosion occurred. Mike suffered severe burns on his hands, wrists, and around his face, burning his ears, neck, and hair. He also developed an extreme case of CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, in his hands and arms. He now can't use his hands in any type of work. The Insider Exclusive will show how Mike's lawyer, Kent Spence of the Spence Law Firm, proved in Canna Oil and Gas falsely filled out the OSHA permit which triggered this catastrophic accident. We'll also show how Kent took on in Canna and Riley and got justice from Mike Melton. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Jerry Spence's Thunderhead Ranch in Wyoming. Stay tuned. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mike Melton's attorney, Kent Spence. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a nice hat you got there. Thank you. This has been an amazing case, another example of how corporate America, in this case, corporate Canada, corporations don't want to take responsibility for hurting the little guy. Tell us about this case. That's exactly right. This case is against in Canada. In Canada stands for Energy Canada. It's a huge multinational corporation that's located up in, in Canada, but they have a U.S. office, and it's called In Canada USA, and that's who we sued in this case. It is, a, uh, it is massively involved in the oil fields all the way through the United States, through all the Rocky Mountains, down, clear down into Texas. Uh, and in this case, it was a case near Moab, Utah, at a gas plant that in Canada owned. And my guy, Mike Melton, who was so severely injured, was a man who was hired as a sub as a sort of subcontractor, independent contractor with his company, Riley, and they would come in and clean out these tanks for Encana. Encana had the responsibility at this plant and would not let any anyone else be in charge of locking out and tagging out all the gas lines that come into this tank. And, and what, what does that mean exactly, locking out and tagging out? It's, it's a policy in, the oil, in most oil field practices when you're going to go into a tank that's got explosive gases in it that you make sure that every valve going in there is not only locked so that it's a T-valve. Sealed. It's actually got a lock that's put on it, a chain and a lock, mm -hmm. and then it's tagged. And it's tagged with the time and the date and the person that tagged it so that if anyone else comes by, they will not open that tank. Because if that tank gets open and there's fuel, there can be fire. And there's many, many sources of ignition that you can't control, like in this case, iron sulfide. You couldn't control it. But the one thing that you could control is the fuel, no fuel, no fire. Mm -hmm. Now, when you presented this case to the jury, because obviously in Canada and Riley said it was Melton's fault, didn't he? That's right. Riley was his own employer. And yeah. the reason that his employer, he, Mike Melton was the employee of the year. He was the star employee for, the, for Riley Company. He was loved by all his workers and he was loved by his employer. But his employer turned on him and tried to make him out to be a bad worker, to look like a bad worker in front of the jury. And the reason was, is that because of some... In the oil field these days, there's these indemnity contracts, and we don't need to get into it, but there, it's a way that the big oil company doesn't have to be held responsible for the money right. to, the, to the subcontractors. And so Riley had their money and their insurance company at stake, and they turned on their own worker. And not only did they turn on their own worker, but in Canada tried to blame Mike saying that he didn't properly ground out mm -hmm. his, his vacuum truck that is a truck that sucks out all the 
gases out of the tank before you go in. Right. One day he's the best employee of the year. The next day he's the lousiest employee. He's the worst employee, and he <laughs> caused the whole accident. He caused his own problem. Okay. Right. Now, when you went before the jury, tell us how you told his story and how this whole case developed. Well, the jury learned in this case the real truth. They learned that the real source of the ignition wasn't the issue here, even though we were able to prove that it was iron uh, iron sulfide, which can, when exposed to oxygen, can set off a spark. But we were able to prove that the real the the real issue in the case was control the fuel. And in this case, there is a thing called the confined entry permit, confined space entry permit. And what the confined space entry permit is, and it's required by by OSHA, by Federal OSHA, Occupational Safety Health Administration, and it's required by them, by law, so that when you go into a confined space with gas, that there's certain steps that you have to take on this form, on this permit, to make sure that there's no gases in there, and it's set out to protect the worker. Right. On this permit, it has a box, and it says, lock out and check and tag out. And it says, do not check this box until the exactly. action has been taken. So this was a case where they actually, <clears throat> as you mentioned, they checked the box, they gave it to the worker to put on the valve, that worker never ended up doing it. That's they? exactly right. What happened is that they, the supervisor who was in charge took the confined safety permit that morning, the confined entry permit, checked the box for the worker, mm -hmm. gave it to the worker and said, here's your job, go down there and secure the tank for Mike Melton right. and his crew. And the worker that was sent down there wasn't properly trained in the area, wasn't familiar with the different valves in the area and didn't realize that there was a huge uh, butane and propane tanks that came right down into this tank and right there was a valve that was left wide open, and that was the source of the fuel. And we were able to prove that. Yeah. How did you find out, how did you discover that this uh, tag had been falsely, well, had been filled out, but never actually someone executed it so that it was actually safe? How did you find that out? Well, we took the deposition of uh, the worker. And he, who's, he admitted it. He admitted that, that what happened was that the box was already checked when I got it, mm -hmm. that when I went down there, I wasn't familiar with the area, and I just assumed that it had already been done. So right. the the supervisor, by checking the box and handing it to the worker, mm -hmm. made the worker believe that the, that the lockout and tagout had been done, and he wasn't familiar with the area, and so the, the tank wasn't shut off. Right. So that testimony was kind of devastating. Oh, it just destroyed yeah. him. And I and I think that you have a document there right. that that shows that uh, valve not closed, man burned, yeah. something to that effect. Now, when you were presenting this to the jury, um, one of the strategies you employ successfully in your career are things that you learned at the trial lawyers college, telling the story. Okay? That's true. Why don't you recreate for us? Imagine you're in front of the jury and you're addressing the jury, and tell us what you told the jury. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if I, I'm Mike Melton. I'm Mike Melton at the time that I'm down inside the pit and the tank is down inside this concrete pit and I'm down inside the pit and I'm getting ready to vacuum out the tank and to clean out the tank, that's my job. And I have a gas mask on, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's covering my eyes, and it's covering my face, and I'm down there, I've got oxygen connected to it, and I have the tank open, and the place has been vacuumed out of all the gases, and I'm down there with my son. My son is standing right next to me. And all of a sudden, Whoosh! And from the back of the tank came these flames. And they came at me, and as I saw them coming, I pushed my son out of the way to save my son. And the flames hit me, 
and I'm back up against the wall and the flames are burning me and my eyes are burning and my, and my hair is burning off and my hands, and I'm putting my hands in front of my face, and my hands are burning, and I can't see where I am. I'm in hell. And I run, I finally there's a, a little break, and I run over to get on a ladder, and I try to climb up the ladder, and the, the flames are melting my oxygen, uh, my oxygen hose, and I can't get my oxygen hose free, and I can't get up the ladder, and I'm stuck, and the flames are coming again. And then... I finally am able to take the melted hose and pull it off and I run to the back and there's another ladder in the back and I start to climb up and as I'm climbing up, my skin is dripping off of my hands and I'm leaving the skin on the ladder as I climb up and I get to the top and my son grabs me and helps pull me over the rail and throws me back and rips the mask off of my face. It's horrible. What happened after that? Mike was in such extreme pain uh, and, and was so burned. He was burned all over his hands. His hands had to have, uh, well, first off, uh, he was taken, obviously. Uh, he sat, actually, on the back of a pickup and taken up to the headquarters at the plant. Mm -hmm. And then he was taken by ambulance. But ultimately, his hands were so burned that he had to have had to have grafting all over his hands. His hands were permanently clawed, and uh, he was so severely injured that he could never work again. Uh, he did try to go back to work at Riley mm -hmm. with his hands in this condition, and he couldn't do it. And Riley tried to make him out to be some kind of a, of a malingerer, <laughs> some kind of a faker yeah. in this deal. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, he developed something called complex regional pain syndrome. Some people know it as RSD, which is reflex symp uh, sympathetic dystrophy. But what it is, is a, in simple terms, is a pain syndrome that can develop where the nerves are so damaged in the, in the area that the signals that go to the brain get messed up. Mm -hmm. And the brain is sending signals saying that there is extreme pain. And so the person is in, in extreme pain will he develop this in both his hands and it developed up his arms um, it it then started communicating the pain through his nervous system through his shoulders mm. and back around through his other side so he was in such extreme pain when I had his pain doctor on the stand I asked her and this was his own treating doctor I said what's it like for Mike What's it like to have that kind of pain? Because he says it's 10 out of 10 pain. She says it's like putting your hands in a hot cast iron skillet all day long, and there's no way out of it. And I said, well, what's the future for him? And she sat there, and tears rolled down her eyes in front of the jury, and she just said it's not good. How many years has it been since this accident happened? Now, the trial was in um, a little over a year ago. It's been, um, actually two years ago, it's been um, a few years before that, so it's probably been four years, and Mike still lives with this every day. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, part, of the, part of the solution for the injury was an implant was to put an implant into his back, right. which is an electric stimulator, to put it down into his spine, in his back, uh, battery operated, and there is there was a 50-50 chance that uh, it would have some effect in reducing his pain by 50%. Is that that radio frequency thing? It's a radio frequency kind of thing. It's, it's, it's an electronic stimulator. Kind of defers the pain some other place. You know, and I scientifically I can't explain mm -hmm. exactly how it happens, but he's had uh, during this case I can't remember the exact amount of shots, but it was something like close to seventy shots that he had had in his spine, and he had to have these shots through his throat that are where the needle goes right through the front of his neck and goes through into his spine and injects into his spine 
so that he can get some temporary I mean, he's, relief. He's awake during all this. Oh, yeah, he yeah, he's awake. And How he's often getting, does he have to do He was getting these a couple of times a week. There's a, there's a chart that we have that yeah. shows, and, and you can just flash it, it just shows blocks of colors all over it that shows that month after month after month, all his life was, was going to doctors, doing physical therapy, going through grafting operations, going through releasing operations of the, of the uh, constriction, constriction in his fingers. Yes. And uh, to this day, he's, he's unable to work. Wow, that is uh, amazing. Now, you in this in in trying the case, it's important for our audience to understand what your mindset is, what the Spence Law Firm mindset is, is that you're willing to take cases all the way to trial to verdict. Correct? That's exactly right. And you wrote a paper which was don't sell your client's case short because oftentimes you know, a company will come in and offer you a lowball offer, which is never going to right. cover anything here. That's right. In this case, in this case, in in Canada, insulted us before trial with a million dollar offer. They thought maybe we would be like some law firms that might take that kind of money. Mm -hmm. We refused that. We didn't even we didn't even acknowledge the the offer. I turned around and walked out of the settlement conference. They made a series of offers as the trial went on, right? There were some other offers. There was, a, I think that we saw another, another million uh, before we went through the whole trial. And then we did see an offer right before the closing argument that was, uh, that was pretty substantial that was also turned down. That was right before they went into the jury room, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, the, at, this case, at this stage, they all of a sudden knew that they were in trouble. Yeah. Uh, we had... We had gone through the trial of um, the liability stage. The, the judge had split the case up, so we had to prove the liability stage first. And mm -hmm. we got 100% liability. They tried to blame Mike Melton, right. and we got 100% liability against In Canada. Mm -hmm. Then it became the next stage with the same jury was, was about the injuries mm -hmm. and was the damages phase. Right. But it also included punitive damages. Because this federal court judge in Utah believed that what we had done in the case is that we had proved that there was reckless disregard for the worker by this company through their, con through their confined safety uh, permit problem. And that was a company-wide problem. They yes. had the head safety man, who was a man named Allred, who had said, oh, uh, this, th this is a proper practice to check the box first. Mm -hmm. He came in, the puppeteers from the big corporate office sent him in to try to save the case. Yeah. And I said, so it's your testimony that all through the Rocky Mountains and all the way down into New Mexico and Texas, that this is how this company operates. That's your testimony. You in say? violation of federal law, in violation of federal OSHA. And he said yes. <laughs> right on the stand. He's right saying. on the stand. Uh, now, I understand the... Canadian corporation in, in Canada was not even at the trial, right? In the beginning. No, in, in Can Energy Canada from the Canadian company. Yeah. I mean, when we say they weren't there, well, they sent in their people. Yeah. Uh, the corporate offices in the U.S. were in Denver. Right. On the 17th floor of a skyscraper. And, uh, and they knew that they were in trouble because... They knew that they were going to be held accountable. They had all kinds of underlying insurance problems going on. There were mm. fights between insurance companies behind the scenes. And there became a lawsuit between the insurance companies right. afterwards as to who was going to pay. The bottom line is, is when it came down to the end of the trial, once we, they, they knew that we had 100% liability and that we knew, they knew that we had punitive damages and they knew that I had asked for $100 million dollars in punitive damages, in $21 million in actual damages, his pain and suffering, his lost wages, his uh, uh, all, all the, the non-economic and the economic damages added up to $21 million. Mm -hmm. When they knew that they were looking at $121 million and they knew that this jury was with us, 
all of a sudden that they knew that they were in serious, serious trouble. Mm -hmm. And they knew that this judge was going to let us argue punitive damages in my closing argument. And so the night before uh, the, oh, the closing argument, they came to me and called me downstairs from my hotel into a conference room. And I said, look, I'm getting ready for a closing argument. I don't want to talk right now because I thought it would be another insulting offer. Right. And at that point it was, it was an $8 million offer right. that and, we turned down. Yeah, and your client was telling you something at that time, wasn't he? Wonderful, wonderful human being. And he said, you know, Kent, he said they would have just kicked me to the curb if it wasn't for you and your law firm. Mm -hmm. They would have just kicked me to the curb. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm broke, mm -hmm. I need the money, uh, I, I can't ever work again. Mm -hmm. I, I need the money for medical care. He says, but you know, you've gotten me this far. And he says, I'm going to trust you. In other words, don't take the deal. Go for broke. Don't take the deal. Go for broke. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did. We turned down the $8 million. I went in uh, after a long night of, of preparation for my closing argument. Mm -hmm. If, and if you would be so kind to share with our audience your closing argument as best as you can remember it, because you're talking to the jury. Well, you know, pretend um, that we are the jury. It's more than I can do here. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think resonated with the jury, aside from the hearing about that, not only did they blame this man and want to not take responsibility mm -hmm. because they wanted to hold on to their money, the millions of dollars that they owed Mike Melton, they wanted to hold on to, mm -hmm. but that they tried to blame Mike for everything. And then when they saw how extremely injured Mike was, and when the jury saw what a wonderful man he was and how he had this beautiful daughter, Stephanie, that was sitting in the audience saying, Daddy, you know, why can't you go biking with me? Because they used to ride motorcycles together, mm -hmm. you know. Daddy, why can't we go swimming together? And she knew the answer. But I looked at Stephanie, and when I said that, they were both crying. Because it was a huge, huge loss to them both as a father and a daughter. Mm -hmm. When you are addressing the jury, do you see the different expressions of some of the jurors and see that you're connecting with them at different times? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean... Um, uh, of course, I don't. I don't claim to uh, to be able to read a juror's mind, yeah. as some lawyers may may claim. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some do claim that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, um, but I I think that what happens in the process of of a two or three week trial or a month long trial mm -hmm. is that we all get to know each other. Yes. And when we continue to bring the truth to them, and they see that they can trust us and they see that we're bringing the real truth, the real story to them. Mm -hmm. And they start to see through the fraud and the lies of the corporation. Then there is a bonding that happens. There is a mm -hmm. group that's formed between the, the plaintiff attorney right. and the jurors and our client. Right. And once that bond happens, the jury is there to fight for the rights of our client. Because they can imagine that they're Mike Melton. That's exactly right. Now, you settled confidentially uh, this case, the financial part of it. The, what happened is after the closing argument, and with the, with the Encana corporate defense lawyers sitting there at counsel table watching it, after the jury was released to deliberate, I was pulled out into the hall. And what, what, what exactly did they say to you? Would you mind coming out? We need to talk to you. Yes, uh, Mr. Spence, uh, we would like to <laughs> talk to you out in the hall. And, and what do you and say? At, well, just what I said when I was trying to get ready for my closing argument. Yeah. I, I, well, at that time, I said, I'm getting ready for a closing argument. I really don't have time to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, I think it'll be worth talking to us, they said. Right. Again, after the jury's deliberating, I said, you know what? I really don't want to talk. Yeah. I'm waiting for my jury to come back. Are they back. pretty persistent? Oh, sure, because they're saying, I think, Mr. Spence, you want to come out and talk to us because <laughs> because I think that the offer that we're going to make you yeah. is 
going to be worth your hearing. And when you go out in the hall, and you did go out in the hall. Yes, I did. What did they did they say it to you or did they write it on a piece of paper? No, they what? just they just say it to me. Yeah. And Do you uh, counter that offer? Yeah, of course. You know, if they say whatever the amount you say, give me double. Of course, and and I can't tell you at this point I can't go any farther yeah, in that negotiations yeah. because it is confidential right. and I always stand on my word. Right. Uh however, um uh, let's just say that uh, in that period from the night before the closing until after the closing happened, that in Canada, with their corporate defense attorney coming down from the towers, woke up yeah. and uh, gave real value to Mike Melton and knew that they were in serious trouble uh, on the case. Now, we did talk to the jury afterwards. Yes. And when I talked to the jury out in the hall... Uh, and they hadn't had much time to deliberate. I said, well, wh at what stage were you? And this young lady said, oh, Mr. Spence. She said, it only took us 15 minutes to award the $21 million. <laughs> She said, we were just in the process of, of debating how the much period. to award of the of the $100 million. I said, well, how much would you have given? She said, I was going to give you the full $121 million. When you came back into the courtroom and you announced to the judge who had reached the settlement, were you looking at your client? Were you looking at your client's family? We actually did it in chambers, uh -huh. and I did have them standing there with me. What was your feeling? Um, my feeling was that that um, this family, who was who were, were special people, uh, the the salt of the earth, honest, hardworking mm -hmm. people, that this should have never happened to, but for this this horrendous sloppy practice by this huge corporation and to stand there with them and to know that we took it to the end, to know that we didn't sell that client short was one of the greatest moments of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest joy of being a trial lawyer. And that's one of the greatest joys of being a trial lawyer is that you know that you are fighting for ordinary people yes. against massive power. Yes. And they have all the money against you. Right. They right. have all the best corporate defense attorneys against you. Yeah, it's because it's be great because of great lawyers like you that you win and you'll continue winning. And we're gonna put your website and your phone number up there. And I want to thank you very much for sharing this story. Thank you. It was fabulous. Thank it was you. one of the best stories I've ever heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. You can get more information about this case, Kent Spence and the Spence Law Firm at www.insiderexclusive.com. You can also watch some of our documentaries at legalshowtime.com. Thank you.